Uh, so I'm Elena, as uh, Charlie just introduced me. Uh, I'm the chair of the Capacity Development Working Group. I'm really excited to virtually meet all of you today, as well as to take over af after such an interesting session on localization and site management support, and such an interesting uh, and exciting uh, music uh, break. Um, so thanks, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, so it's actually great to have so many people joining from so many different countries around the world. And in fact, today, uh, we want to reflect a bit on how through a, a global platform like the CCM Global Cluster, we can support you to contextualize and adapt your capacity development activities to your own operation. So how to think globally, but train locally. Uh, so with our uh, uh, panelists, we will reflect, discuss, uh, share, uh, and learn tips for facilitators working with uh, local communities, working with authorities, and uh, also engaging with online participants. So we will try to answer uh, your question on, for example, how we can uh, engage participants during online workshop and keep them interested and uh, um, actively participating. Uh, we will also ask ourselves questions on how we can meaningfully engage uh, local communities during trainings, or how we can adapt activities to you know, better define roles and responsibility, unpack the CCM framework uh, Bruce was referring to, uh, especially maybe new operation, and explain the added value of CCCM. Uh, so we will try to answer this question through a panel discussion in plenary, and then we will move to breakout groups. Uh, but during the panel discussion, you will be actually the one asking the question and sharing the question for our, uh, for our panelists. So we prepare uh, three slides on Mentimeter. Um, you can take your phone, go to Mentimeter right now and insert the uh, code that you see on, this, on, on the screen. So the code is 6361-6034. So we prepared these three questions uh, that um, aim to um, have you sharing with us what are your challenges when training uh, communities, when training authorities, and uh, when training remotely. So please do feel free to share uh, your question, your request uh, for support for our panelists. And um, after I will introduce them, we will take your, pick your question from the Mentimeter um, and, and go into the panel discussion. So please uh, do uh, share your inputs on the Mentimeter while I introduce us uh, the panelists. So the first panelist uh, with us today uh, is Ingrid. Ingrid is a capacity building coordinator for IOM in Bangladesh and is also a dear friend of the capacity development working group. And she's here with us today to focus on training communities. Hi Ingrid. Hi Elena. Good evening. So, good evening. We know it's, it's late in Bangladesh so we, we appreciate your joining us today. So just to kick off our discussion, uh, can I ask you what is the most precious, precious advice that you can give to other facilitators that are you know, in charge of facilitating training with local communities? Your top tip. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting because the heart of our work is really like training uh, the communities. Uh, and uh, we know we talk about capacity building of other actors, but interestingly, our work uh, goes back to the heart of uh, camp management, which is the communities themselves. And I know there are uh, several challenges to this one, like in the uh, emergent, right after an emergency where you have to, to go uh, to meet with the communities and uh, like not knowing yet, uh, the profile but uh, even at, at that point you can already engage with them like even asking questions uh, on what are their uh, basic like uh, understanding and basic needs that they have so uh, a quick tip for facilitators and I know all of us who are here in the room who have been uh, doing trainings it's really trying to know the profile of our community the profile of the group the profile of our participants who are the persons that we are uh, going to train with and, and train for? So I think that's a basic uh, important thing is to know the person and then comes later on the methodology and the approaches that we can do. So that's a quick tip one, Elena. <laughs> yes. Thanks, Ingrid. That was, that was great, actually. Um, 
So our second panelist is Emmanuel, who is the Senior CCM Cluster Coordinator for the C recently activated cluster in Burkina Faso. And he's going to focus on training local authorities today and uh, something he has uh, loads of experience on. Thank you for joining us, Emmanuel. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. And great seeing you and great seeing Ingrid and uh, really nice being here. Thanks. So I want to ask you the same question to you, Emmanuel. Uh, can you give us the most important secret uh, that every facilitator should know uh, when he or she engage uh, with uh, training local authorities and local partners? Well, I, I really believe Ingrid kind of also sort of nailed it right on target. But one of the things that I think I want to say what, that I want to add to what Ingrid already said is really to take your time to understand your context, the cultural nuances before diving into it. And one of the things personally that I find very, very important when dealing with authorities is being able to be self and or autocritical. And I find that that will take you a very long way with the authorities because there is always this clash between the authorities. So I think that's a good way to break the ice if you be being autocritical and call up uh, the organizations, us, the UN agencies, the NGOs that are not doing things the proper way. And if you can be self-critical, and I think that will take you a long way with the authorities. Thank you, Elena. Over to you. Thank you. Well, indeed, being self-critical, I think it's something that uh, can lead you very far in life generally. So it's a really great tip. Thank you so much, Emmanuel. And our third panelist um, is a former member of the uh, CCM Global Cluster family. Currently, um, she is the Senior Diversity and Inclusion Officer with UNHCR Geneva, Geneva, Cynthia, and she's going to um, focus on training remotely. Hi, Cynthia. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, Elena. Happy to be here. <laughs> So similarly, can you give us your top tip uh, based on your you know, several experiences with training online over the past uh, couple of years with the pandemic? Uh, mm -hmm. So what are the top tips for you when training remotely? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build on what uh, Emmanuel and Ingrid said about contextualization. Um, so training remotely will not necessarily be online, but you have to adapt to the context and the access that uh, your participants and the your targeted audience have, but I will also add that having a system where continuous feedback in the approach that you're having is possible so you can adapt and planning. It's, it's so much more than just adapting something to deliver online or sending slides. You really have to better understand your own environment. So take the time to planning and get to know the stakeholders at a, at a deeper level in order for the message to come across. Thanks. That's a great tip. So now that we broke the eyes, uh, we can go into the panel discussion and we can open the Mentimeter right now and see um, what are the questions that you share for um, uh, Emmanuel, Ingrid and, uh, um, and Cynthia. Wow, okay, so many questions. So let's start with training communities and with Ingrid, so let's see. Um, um, do, 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 do. So there are some questions related to incentives, uh, lack of motivation from participants. So these are some of the challenges that it seems our um, participants are facing when training communities. Uh, what advice you have, for, which advice you have for them, Ingrid? Yeah, this is very real in our experiences when training with communities, like the motivation part. And I think we share that also uh, even uh, in, in different uh, target groups, uh, not just with the community. So I think one question that we always ask is how relevant uh, is this training or this uh, content to the community? If it speaks about their uh, basic uh, questions, like in, in a camp management CCM, like uh, questions on services, uh, service provision on assistance if it speaks to them like recently uh, I've had trainings on with the community on example very specific to COVID on uh, community health referrals uh, and even dead body management uh, which was a very important issue to them so I think in terms of motivation when the the, the topic when the when the content uh, appeals or is very relevant to them then it's easy to work uh, closely uh, with their with their leaders in developing 
this one. Second, uh, I know the incentive uh, comes as a, an issue in, in terms of snacks and, and all that one. And I think uh, in, in part of the training of the communities, it's very important that we know also uh, uh, the needs of, of the community that we're training. So in example, like uh, if uh, incentivizing it, uh, not necessarily in monetary form, it can be in terms of uh, like support kits that can help them uh, that can also be a part of it but what lastly what I can say it's really like working I've, I've been working closely really with community leaders and sitting with them both the women and also so the, the men members like, okay, how does this uh, uh, appeal to the community in terms of relevance and how do we encourage? So it's the community themselves, leaders who motivate uh, the, the community and really trying to, to speak the issues that matter to them. So th that's one thing that I can think of right now. Great, thank you. And actually, let me ask you another question because uh, there is one flowing in that I think it's particularly interesting and says that you know training packages and and uh, and CCCM are concept written from the point of view of NGOs or UN agency, not communities. So this is a challenge for uh, uh, one of our participants. Uh, how would you face this challenge uh, yourself, Ingrid? Yeah, and I think my colleagues uh, Emmanuel and Cynthia can speak of this one. Uh, the camp coordination and camp management, uh, practically, uh, maybe uh, the technical. Uh, concepts are there but in my experience in in working uh, even at the onset like when you speak like when you show the house even the ccm house so when you speak of basic like uh, the communities talk about shelter the need for shelter clothing the need for food uh, the need for protection safety so health uh, this matters to them so more than concepts and frameworks uh, these are real uh, and practical uh, concerns for them and then what ccm does is that uh, when we uh, help the community, like uh, these needs, we, we channel in terms of uh, uh, the, the assistance that we provide in coordinating with this partner. So uh, in our trainings, like uh, the, the camp management house is a classic example where they see that like CCM is like a family, it's like a household, a home for them where you have pillars, right? So uh, I think it, it speaks to them closely when, when you have this image of home, uh, apart from the technical concepts but I know these are also important but yeah our entry is a uh, family uh, which has uh, this uh, support uh, system so thanks Elena so just a snapshot <laughs> yeah and indeed it also means that you know the use of the uh, of the command management house as a visual tool to pass some some concept is is a great tip also for other you know for other kind of modules and how we can adapt activities for for communities Emmanuel, I feel that you might have also something interesting to share about training packages uh, written from the point of view of NGOs or, uh, or UN. Um, do you think that this is a challenge for you when training authorities or how do you normally face, deal with this challenge? Uh, well, I mean, the way, of course, obviously there are always challenges uh, with when dealing with authorities and, you know, especially APOEB, that resistance anyway, in fact, of even admitting that, uh, that that's needed. Uh, but I think what, what Cynthia said earlier uh, was very important. It's like planning, planning, planning. You cannot overly plan for trainings and also building that rapport with the authorities. I mean, in my case here in, in Burkina Faso, it was particularly uh, different because CCCM was widely unknown here in the country, both uh, from the authorities and even by the humanitarian community. So, and that's what I said earlier when I talked about take the time to know your context, the cultural nuances. And I think that's what I had to go through and then finding that opportunity to uh, when seize it. And, and then, so that's what I was able to do. And, and then luckily for us that those trainings, capacity building trainings that I have been that's been taking place here in Burkina, that's what ultimately actually led to the activation of the cluster. We came to a point where the authorities were the ones actually pushing for trainings. They were uh, demanding that, and I think, and and that's one of the great benefits of CCM. That's why I love it so much. I think this is one of the better trainings that 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 there are when talking about uh, this, if, uh, in comparison to other clusters. Like was Ingrid was talking about the uh, the 
the, 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 the house, you know, the CCM house, well, I call it my house. And then one of the things that I really wanted to add to what Ingrid was saying earlier, uh, talking about community participation, for instance, that's one of the models that I really, really, really like, like showing them that those different levels of participation, you know, being from passive to, to empowerment. And, and, and then, so the way I do, I deal with training, is it's, I don't necessarily, I'll, I'll kind of, you know, uh, size up the, the audience. There are some models that I won't take as much time and versus others that I will devote them like two or three hours. I mean, I'm a work trainer, unfortunately, not that, that, that's something everybody can agree with, but really size up the audience and then see what, what's important, what, what are the issues, you know, for them and take the time to, to answer them. And, and I think you go a long way when, uh, when you take your time to properly explain the, the concepts and not just going over the models like you know ticking of the box type of thing and and then once they see that they see that commitment that dedication from you as a trainer as a facilitator and all the emotions you know you put into it you know sharing the experience and and that 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 can easily sell it and i mean i'm speaking from experience yeah thank you over to you uh, elena great thanks emmanuel and i see here a uh, couple of questions uh, from our challenges shared by our participants related to turnover of staff uh, within the local authorities or difficulties in targeting, uh, you know, uh, key actors within the different local authorities, departments, stakeholders uh, that really have, you know, the power to change things and the power to implement things and to activate the knowledge that they will get through the training. Um, what would be your advice uh, for this challenge? How would you face this challenge yourself? Emmanuel? I'm sorry, Elena. Oh, I thought you were talking to Cynthia. What was it? No, 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 sorry. <laughs> I was talking to you. No worries. So how would what you was the uh, question take, again? So for example, here they are highlighting turnover of staff and turnover of stakeholders as a challenge uh, or difficulties to you know, engage with uh, counterparts with the local authorities that have you know, the power to change things after the training and to get these you know, powerful people into the training themselves. So how would you face this challenge yourself? I mean, the way I've done it here, actually, I mean, it's a very practical example here in Burkina Faso, where I have engaged firsthand on the, the highest authorities here that are in charge of the IDP response. And uh, clearly, because like I said earlier, CCCM was widely unknown. So I started doing uh, bilateral meetings uh, with the, the ministers, you know, like the, the technical, uh, uh, and then the governors, the mayors, like for instance, la last, like two weeks ago, I've organized not a training per se, but like a, a workshop, a two-day meeting with the highest authorities of the major regions of the displacement that are included in the HRP, just to make sure that uh, we can all speak the same CCCM uh, common language and really understanding because uh, making sure that they understand as first line of responders, uh, they need to know this, they need to be aware. And also to show them the, the benefit of having CCCM in terms of being able to improve the overall humanitarian response. And, and like I said, honestly, even though I was really surprised by the, by the outstanding results that we've had here in Burkina Faso, I cannot necessarily say that it'll always be the same. And, and, and that's then again, it goes down back down to the context, to the, you know, the cultural nuances and take this time. And I know often in humanitarian emergencies, time is a luxury, but we still need to take the time to understand what we're dealing with here and in whom we are dealing with. And then and sort of not having this tunnel vision where we, we have only one way of taking, thinking. And, you know, and also just make, you know, like shy away from this copy and paste mentality is something that works somewhere else and you think it's going to work here and, and then when oftentimes it's not going to be the case so it's really and then and then a lot of time they really mean well they want to do good you know i'm looking at a lot of the questions here on the mentimeter then and i think we've been able to deal uh with um all of those issues here uh, in burkina faso and again it was interesting because at the end of the day they were the ones pushing for activation and then because of you know that we've been able to accomplish and i think we were able to 
sort of show that empathy, that understanding, and then showing them that we really want to be uh, working together. I'm looking at the square here, apathy. So exactly. So and then to connect, you know, and then build that, they make you know, build that credibility, that rapport. And that's, you know, uh, and I'm not saying it's always easy. And then you also need patience because I've been given the one on one for the first six months here in Burkina Faso. But I said fast, I'm like, okay, no, we got to do it. So, and ultimately, uh, we stay persistent and then showing them, you know, the, uh, the importance of it. And we are able to finally succeed. And, and then now it's only the beginning of the work, by the way, with the activation. So that means a whole lot more is expected from us, obviously. Great. Thank you, Elena. So you, 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 must be, you must be tired, but also excited at the same time, I guess. <laughs> so let's see what our uh, participants submitted in terms of questions for um, uh, when training remotely. Hmm, okay, so I guess there are a lot of uh, um, questions around or challenges related to interaction and engaging uh, participants. So Cynthia, did you face these challenges yourself and uh, how did you cope with them? Yes, definitely. In terms of engaging with the participants, it's, it's always a challenge. You don't necessarily have the cameras on because the connectivity is not strong enough. You don't necessarily uh, know the language level uh, in, in the following. Uh, are received the way you want them to be received. Uh, so it's always a challenge. I think in terms of interaction, we have to remember that it's still a human experience despite it being remote, despite being online. So how do you create this? Uh, your human experience is, is, you know, is good enough to create an environment of trust. Because uh, that's how you learn, in a very many traps with examples. So you have to be interactive. You have to create space for informal chats, uh, maybe even one-on-one -on -one with some of the trainers. So you have to build these spaces uh, that, that replace the interactions and the, the links that will... Um, that would have taken place in a face-to-face -face training, for example. So the, the discussion over the, co the coffee machine or after, or the teamwork after at the end of the day. So you need to create those spaces online or remotely. So it could be through a WhatsApp group, through challenges, video, et cetera, where people feel like they get, they're getting to know the other participants and they're more, is, is also linked to the, some people are, are stuck and not stuck, quote unquote stuck, but they also have their daily engagements. So because it don't necessarily are taking out of their office, so their phone will ring, their manager will ask them something. What do you do to mitigate that? And those are the questions. It, it will always depends on your team, the, con uh, the contact that you have with the people on the ground. Um, I know that Astrid, for example, did wonderful trainings last year where um, our counterparts in Mali had rented a room in the hotel. So while she wasn't there, she was able to deliver training remotely to people who had been taken out of the work environment and they could focus during that day. So it, it will, again, it go, it's gonna be built on what Ingrid and Emmanuel said regarding contextualization and know your audience in order to make sure that uh, you are as creative as possible to create this, these different pockets of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, human interactions. And obviously it's really hard for a trainer to talk to a computer, um, especially if the cameras are off, <laughs> but you need to keep a certain level of energy. Uh, it's, it's draining because you don't give it back, but your tone of voice, the pace that you're putting together will definitely help in that sense. Yeah, I feel you and I wanna thank you everyone who is there. Uh, has decided to keep their camera on because uh, it also makes my experience a bit more real. Um, and, you know, I, I like that you quote the experience from, uh, uh, from Astrid because that's also like a way uh, to overcome, uh, for example, connectivity problems, like uh, still training remotely while gather, you know, all the participants in a room that we know will have like reliable internet connection. That's great. And I mean, obviously, like we have to uh, use so much training remotely and workshop uh, online because of COVID. And COVID was also highlighted as a challenge when training communities also because, you know, we often 
cannot engage this kind of media with them. We cannot really like invite them to a workshop online or to an online training. So Ingrid, I wanna ask you in your uh, operation, how did you um, face this challenge and what actions did you take uh, to, to, you know, to react, to adapt to this COVID emergency? Yes, uh, exactly. The challenge is real. And since 2020, uh, even when we shifted uh, to remote uh, site monitoring, so we did site monitoring remotely when the, with, we have a limited uh, footprint in the camps. And yet, of course, uh, the CCM continues to uh, still support the community with the COVID challenges. So uh, at that time, uh, camp management really uh, engage with the community leaders. And the good thing, uh, if we have our camp-based volunteers, so here in, in Cox's Bazaar, the, the Rohingya camp based volunteers are really our part of the site management team and we have uh, trainings with them and then also the community uh, health workers so like example in the COVID-19 uh, so I, I mentioned earlier so it, it ranges from prevention so and in, in terms of service monitoring even so the, the volunteers the campus volunteers who are the Rohingyas themselves are the one really uh, providing uh, the information but that is because there was already as, as you mentioned like the pre-trainings previously or all the capacity building sessions that we've done uh, help them also to be uh, able to train the, the local community, like involving the women uh, here in, in uh, the Rohingya refugee camps, the women are very uh, active and engaged in also, especially in training their community women and um, even the, the community members, adolescents, girls, and the persons with disabilities. So uh, when working closely with our uh, volunteers in the camps, it would help a lot uh, even if we have to do uh, like layers of training so we did like remote training first for our staff and then our staff had to because again the language I think that this part of the challenge is also the language barrier so I, I have uh, interpreters but the, the ones who can speak better are the, the Rohingyas themselves so then they train uh, the community uh, themselves and the women the, the men the, the groups the imams so they're the ones like training also their community so it's like really uh, with the layers that uh, you can come across to the community uh, with your key messages and really trying to make the messages like uh, concrete and also simple. Uh, so uh, we keep it simple and, and short so that uh, they get the, the messages there. Yeah. So it, 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 interestingly, like I've mentioned, like I, I've never uh, thought that I'd be training on dead body management. <laughs> so uh, we've been training like uh, the imams on that one, safe and dignified burial through. So also the health cluster, train as and then yeah so I, I never thought I would be doing that one with, but this is interesting for camp management because we were like uh, repurposing or at least the shift uh, of our focus was really on the COVID-19 and how site management or camp management can support the community in this pandemic uh, issues while at the same time retaining the site monitoring the basic services and the coordination so yeah that's it Elena for yeah, you never know where CCM will lead you in life, right? Uh, sometimes uh, it's to remote training, sometimes uh, it's uh, to do dead body management trainings. Uh, I'm glad you actually mentioned a, a challenge related to language, because indeed this was also uh, highlighted uh, as, as one of the main challenges when we train uh, authorities. Uh, so I would like to ask you, I would like to ask you to Emmanuel, who speak so many languages and uh, you know <laughs> uh, and I really really envy him for uh, for this um, so how is important to have you know like to overcome these language barriers uh, how do you do it yourself uh, how do you you know translate uh, materials if you translate it also just in the main like languages or also in, in local languages so how do you normally do and how do you normally overcome these challenges Emmanuel well, thank you, Elena, for this. Well, uh, luckily, like you said, I, I do speak uh, a couple of languages. I've done CCM trainings in Spanish, Portuguese, French, and Haitian Creole. Um, so uh, most of the time, I translate. This the is more myself. than a couple. I mean, <laughs> this is more than a couple. <laughs> I, 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 I know them. I, you know, I know them pretty well. The slides. So, and then also when I'm 
of course, and that one other thing that I've always said when I'm delivering those trainings, you know, I always, you know, apologize for the language because sometimes, you know, the translation, I usually explain to people, unfortunately, most of the training materials are in English and sometimes you do a last minute translation, maybe an hour before you actually get into the, the training home. And, and one of the things, but it's, it's becoming more difficult for actual local languages. And then some of the participants, uh, some of the requirements that I have, had here, for instance, in Burkina Faso, is that they can uh, facilitate another training, uh, replicate that training in one of the local languages like uh, More or Full Full Day in, uh, in the example here in the case of Burkina Faso. And one of the things that I have tried last year that I'm trying to do this year is that having uh, I've contracted uh, one of those uh, uh, footage companies where they can actually video record uh, my trainings and then uh, and then so they can translate it into local languages. Like I've done a, a training uh, recently on uh, on GDV uh, remotely, where we had a translator from, uh, I mean, I was only available uh, uh, via a video, and then they were actually viewing the video recording that I, that they produced for me and then if they had questions and that was already translated into the local language and then if they had questions they would translate it uh, into French and I would render it of course obviously it it takes a little bit more uh, more time it's more time consuming and and then myself actually before joining the UN the, this I was an interpreter myself so it hurts me sometimes working through interpreters because I know it's not always reliable uh, but those are ways that uh, that that we try to do that, and then I, I mean I've also done consecutive interpretation, like if having somebody uh, next to me so that you know make sure, and then usually I can see I can just look at in people's faces eyes. I'm like no, they're not understanding. Even in French, actually, even if supposedly if the audience speak French, I'll say something, and I'm like, Are you sure you understand? I'm like, you know, don't lie to me if you will. So let's you know. If, and then people would open up and then we'll try to find ways to to explain it. And sometimes I, I use uh, the, the participants themselves because you also have participants that, you know, that can speak more than one language, that can understand the local language better, the, the nuance, the cultural uh, nuance with it. And then, so you have to be able to use all those uh, sources. So I rely a lot on participants that also speak more than one language. And I also ensure that uh, I have those materials translated into uh, the local language to, over the, you know, not necessarily written because you have the literacy rate, which is, you know, uh, which is usually uh, high literacy rate in a lot of those contexts, but have the visuals so, and, you know, and the audio where people can actually uh, listen and be able to ask questions. So we, I'm getting ready, we're getting ready to produce a big documentary on all of our CCCM activities here and most of the trainings where we can, and especially in those out to reach areas, you know, if we can't get to it, at least, you know, through the local authority, through the mayor or through somebody else, and then have that uh, where people, you know, at least have, uh, because that, all, that also goes very well with the accountability to affected population. So making sure that the information gets to everybody, you know, with no one left behind. Thanks and over to you, Elena. Thank you. Well, we hope uh, we can play your documentary uh, for the next uh, global meeting uh, during the break, although this might upset DJ Aliza, we'll see. Um, so I actually uh, connected to, uh, to the language. I dropped uh, a link in the, in the chat, is the link to the um, uh, CCM glossary uh, with translation of key CCM terms uh, in Arabic, Bahasa, Bosnian, French, Greek, and Spanish. So you can check it out, I dropped the link. Um, and, you know, I'm glad that you also mentioned other ways we have to do training. So, for example, videos. Uh, so Cynthia, I would like to ask you maybe to unpack a bit this, uh, uh, this topic that I think for me is also connected uh, um, with how we can overcome issues that are related to connectivity, uh, you know, and how we can go beyond video calls and, and video workshop. Yes, definitely. I do think that the, the first step is understanding the needs the needs and the capacity of the people uh, that you're trying to reach. And if uh, I, I think that the example that Emmanuel gave, for example, he filmed himself and got the translation. It can be offline uh, homework, food for thought questions. It can be um, having an initial phone call with the key stakeholders, developing a plan, having them monitor and record so you can go back to uh, the discussion table afterwards. It doesn't need 
to be a week long or a continuous time together in order for transfer of skills or knowledge to happen, transfer and exchange of skills and knowledge. So offline activities are also a great way to train remotely. And we shouldn't fear uh, that, the, you know, as a facilitator, we don't have to be there all the time. We have highly skilled, highly com uh, competent and context experts that are asking for sometimes just a top up in terms of knowledge and skills. So giving them orientation and also giving space for creativity on the ground to happen can definitely enhance capacity building in itself, doing it remotely. Um, so it, it's, it's very much creating an environment where problem solving and learning can be done together when it's remote. Um, and, and using, and I think I, I really appreciate what Emmanuel said and what uh, and Ingrid said in, in the, the, the comments as well, technical terms, even sometimes when translated, don't mean much for a community. <laughs> so it also gives the space for, um, uh, for finding new ways to describe, you know, maybe the CCCM house or uh, ways that are more impactful for uh, the people that, are, that you're working with. So in terms of be, going beyond the virtual event is definitely something that should be considered in certain cases and finding ways, even if it's an e-course, so people can do it at their own space or creating different spaces like WhatsApp or, or emails or uh, th those phone conversation with feedback and monitoring of the activities. Great, thanks to you. You should not be afraid to diversified your the way you interact with your participants and uh, that's a good advice um there was also a challenge that was uh, shared regarding uh, training um, communities which is a bit like how can we you know engage everyone especially maybe those who are a little bit um left out or uh, might not be that comfortable to maybe speak in plenary and i think this is a uh, it's kind of a, a challenge that can actually be uh, that we can actually face with all the targets group we are, uh, we are working we are looking at right now. So communities, authorities, and uh, uh, and online participants. Uh, but Ingrid, in your case, how do you deal with this situation? Uh, yes, Elena. Uh, sometimes we we need to know, uh, as I mentioned earlier, like uh, the profile of the group, like. And also we work closely uh, with protection, our team in protection, like if, if there are example like vulnerable groups. So I think in terms of the, the profiling of the participants, it's important to know ahead if like there are certain groups who, who would feel like uh, they're more comfortable in uh, speaking or in sharing in a smaller group. And there are different like, so when we even like, um, Talking about women, uh, there are uh, we sometimes think they're homogeneous, but sometimes there can be different uh, uh, also uh, layers to that one. Like when we deal with like host community women or the refugee women, or even amongst the age. So it is very important to to look into the profile. And I know as trainers, sometimes we are into uh, sometimes in in trainings that uh, we we need to like. Uh, do uh, the preparation uh, in a limited time but as uh, my colleagues are saying Emmanuel and Cynthia are saying like it's always good to have preparation preparation and preparation and I think Jen always repeat this in our training of trainers so it's very important and, and I've been in situations like uh, we had the training where there was no time for needs assessment and all the technical things but we were able to even like let's talk with the community and see their their uh, comfortable if they're comfortable and in terms of the trust and as trainers as Emmanuel mentioned we can sense that I think this is the, the familiarity that we have with the in, in training and participants like if there is like some uneasiness or uh, discomfort uh, in the group and then uh, trying to address so it, this is very in, interesting and important as well so that we train with a team. So co-facilitating is, is also good because it helps us look at uh, the, the, the participants and see if there are groups or individuals uh, who may need uh, some support or are not comfortable in, in the situation, especially when we talk about sometimes uh, uh, protection or GVB, uh, those, those things that I've learned that it's important to really see as trainers. And I see Charlie was also, I think, in the chat say, saying that, yeah, as trainers, uh, I know we 
remember that we can we are facilitators at the same time so we are also learners and we are also instructors so so that triangle like trying to see this with the community and uh, and so not also uh, I have here like uh, some because I'm in the office so there are like some materials that <laughs> yeah this helps connect people and, and we see the, the breaking the ice as, as you mentioned because some might not be a protection concern or issue but it might just be breaking the ice so uh, these exercises and I have all the materials box here like how the, they break the ice in a manner that res that respects and is up appropriate to the to the culture so we've used games that the Rohingyas uh, love themselves like the Ludo the board games uh, the games they play when they were children or they were in their uh, uh, growing up years so something uh, that, that breaks the ice and help them more comfortable I know as, as trainers like we have always that preliminary part which really sets the tone so uh, often we don't rush like going to session one but it's important that the, what sets the tone is having uh, the participants really in the training and, and not just like uh, diving into the first one so that, that's a very simple experience that i've had even here in with the rohingya uh, communities uh, back to you elena great and i i love the fact that you you just have next to yourself your mary poppins bag for facilitators with just all your like tools that's it's great um so it's actually a very interesting discussion and uh, there are some questions that I know we haven't had the chance to um, uh, to pick up and, uh, and ask to the panelists, but the good news is that uh, you can do it yourself um, during the breakout session that uh, we are just going to have. Uh, so we'll just go back to the PowerPoint so I can give you a little bit of instruction for the breakout uh, groups and how this will work. So we will have three breakout groups. So the first one will be dedicated to training communities uh, and Ingrid will be joined by ACID, um, who works with the cluster on capacity building, capacity development. Uh, we will have a second breakout session on training authorities and Emmanuel will be jo joined by Jennifer, who actually uh, doesn't need introduction, but she's also working with the cluster on capacity development. Uh, and, and then finally, we have uh, group number three, uh, focus on training remotely with Cynthia and Charlie. So you will uh, uh, choose the breakout groups you want to uh, join yourself. I, I will start them in just a minute. Um, if you haven't, if you were not in the, in the session uh, over the last couple of days, uh, you will uh, have like a small icon on uh, your uh, control bar at the bottom of the screen with four breakout groups uh, with four like squares that you can select. And uh, I'm going to start the breakout group in a second. Uh, you will have a lot of time to interact with our panelists. Uh, so please, um, you know, do feel free to unmute their, your mic and, and, and ask the questions that uh, you were not able to, to ask during the, the panel discussion. And unless there are any questions for me in the chat on how the breakout groups work, Oh, yes, Charlie. So, sorry, I think I may need to be co-host uh, to be able to share my screen, and I don't think I am at the moment. So just quick one yeah. to Alistair. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, I can, I can see you as, as co-host, actually. Okay, thank you. No worries. Uh, so yes, yeah, unless there are questions on, on how the breakout groups will, uh, will work, I'll just open the room now, and I wish you a fruitful discussion with our panelists and co-facilitators. Um, so I'm just, just before wrapping up, I'm just going to call on our um, panelists to, to just, you know, in one sentence, um, tell us about their, their group, uh, the breakout session, how did it go and what, were, what was the main takeaway. So I will start from Ingrid for uh, breakout group one on training communities. Can you tell us in one sentence? Yes, uh, one sentence. <laughs> so we, 
we we were we were just wrapping up when we were pulled in, and uh, it was interesting. Uh, I think what we realized, like unpacking uh, the training of communities, is really a very rich uh, topic uh, for all of us because there is so much like in terms of diversity in the community. So what was key and very important for all of us was like really knowing the profile of the group of the communities and and also the AGDM. So like knowing uh, even the the different like uh, groups uh, segregated or uh, disaggregated in terms of being able to, to work with them closely and knowing that some may not be comfortable uh, in, in bigger groups. So knowing how when to approach uh, with a smaller group uh, uh, methodology and really planning with them and uh, helping uh, the community members also like to encourage them to be more actively. So even if they're participants, they are also at the same time uh, helping us. And also uh, we as trainers are also learners and there are di different methodologies and resources shared in the chat box. So we hope we can have access to it because really uh, the, per the, the people, the colleagues in the room were like uh, giving us a different uh, links to resources on training communities. So I think that will be very, very helpful. So finally, uh, the heart of our work is really the people and knowing the people whom we facilitate, we, we serve and uh, we um, help empower uh, in terms of building and developing capacity. So it's very important to know the person uh, behind this uh, community member. So back to you, Elena. That's great, Ingrid. And uh, uh, people can also uh, feel free to, to drop resources now in the, in the plenary chat. So also people that were in other breakout group discussion can have access to them. Uh, perfect. So Emmanuel, Jen, Jen was uh, kind of like cut short on uh, while she was wrapping up. Um, but Emmanuel, do you want to uh, just, you know, say, share with us one takeaway, one takeaway from your breakout session uh, on training uh, authorities? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, it was it was really great where we had uh, two different scenarios of uh, training authorities. Um, you know, high profile authorities like governors kind of somewhat, you know, uh, disturbing, not necessarily willing to be trained. And uh, so like a couple of key, key takeaways was the acknowledgement of, you know, their authority recognizing that and how busy they are. And of course, deference and respect and not necessarily um, putting them at a higher level, but at least, you know, understanding that, that dynamic in dealing with them and try making sure that we bring it bring everybody back to what uh, brought us here. And then we also had a, a scenario with the language issue, I think that happened to to many of us, you know, in terms of you started doing a training in English per se, or whatever other language or mainstream language, and then all of a sudden, you know, you have participants say, well, you know, I don't understand starting speaking in a completely foreign language, foreign language that you don't understand, and where you had to sort of, uh, uh, we cross to an interpreter on the spot, time spot. So really different scenarios, and I thought that was really neat. And then those are like day-to-day, uh, -day daily occurrences. You know, it happens to most of us here yeah, as facilitators and trainers, and so that was great. Uh, luckily, we also had a very good group. You know, with uh, experienced trainers that were able to pull it off. Over to you, Elena. Great, thank you, Emmanuel. And uh, Cynthia, do you want to also share with us? Uh, the main takeaway from uh, the session on training remotely. Yes, and I want to thank all the participants for the, the very rich discussion. I think, you know, as some of the points that were raised, you know, you need to choose your tools wisely. Something that can easily work, for example, in the setting like a Mentimeter may not work in a different context. So it's really important to liaise and, and understand the, the, the environment in which people work to make sure to use the, the relevant tools for that training and not lose time for people to get familiar, familiarized with the tools in order for them to participate because that eats up on your time. Um, you learn a lot for, from the unstructured parts of a training. Uh, so from the, the conversation over a coffee machine to the moments where you get to know people that, are, that have the same role as you. So it's important, to, even if it's informal, it's important to carve time in your training for those moments, uh, for people to get to know each other, um, and, and, and that doesn't need to be online. It can also be by present, you know, asking people for biographies and photos and creating this place where people get to know each other um, and creating this opportunity for connection, for, for them to connect. Um, based on, on one of the participants' experience, it's always good to have 
a good tech support, especially if you're doing an online training to make sure that they know when to put the right exercise at the right time. Um, the fact that you're doing remote training gives you flexibility. So if you decide to do something virtual, you don't need to do a full day. You can you know, shorten your sessions, go straight to the point, add uh, offline activities to make sure that the interest stays there. We're all been, you know, a lot of us have been uh, in front of their computer, not so for an entire year, have an entire extra day of training can be uh, very heavy. So, it, it, you know, it's, it's encouraged to go beyond just um, the, 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 the traditional online event um, to, to keep people interested and also to make sure that people are engaged or participating and learning. It was also, it, it'd be interesting and, and recommended to have milestones. So even if it's you're sending readings or you're sending offline support, encouraging or having in your training moments where participants themselves need to create something, either a presentation, a video, or summarize some of the readings, ensure that their, you know, the milestones and the progression in their learning is um, leads to the completion of course with learning objectives met and then the delivery of a certificate. Um, um, something that was seen as a, an advantage, but also sometimes a disadvantage is recording sessions. It's always great to have that resource to go back to, but sometimes it can limit uh, people's interaction, especially if it's on sensitive topics. So it could be interesting to carve time that is not recorded in your remote virtual event, if that's what you choose to do. And uh, finally, building trust, creating an environment. It's still a human experience. Adults learn by, by, uh, by knowing that the topic is relevant to not only their reality, but by doing, and it's by creating and relying as well at their experience that you're able to create an environment of trust, therefore an environment of learning. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you so much, Cynthia. I also take the opportunity to share the guidelines that were like a, a brief paper that was created by the Capacity Development Working Group last year on remote capacity development. Uh, I, or before giving the floor to Charlie, I want to give the opportunity to Dare to say a few words. Dare, are you with us? Yes, I am with you. Um, thank you, colleagues, for the for this uh, very very informative, very useful session. I, I personally learned a lot, and I keep learning from all of you. I just want to take the floor to uh, to tell uh, thank you, Cynthia, uh, Cynthia, um, for the colleagues uh, who know her, and most of us do. Um, she um, unfortunately left uh, uh, the CCCM at the global uh, cluster. She left us. Um, we are always uh, like the Hotel of California song. You can leave whenever, you can check out whenever you want, but you can never leave. So it's very good also to have you. We will allow ourselves to keep calling you in because you carry a, a wealth of experience in CCCM in different contexts, different countries on different topics. So uh, I just want to say on behalf of everyone, a big thank you, Cynthia, for everything you have done to the Global Cluster and wish you the best in your future interviews and keep in touch with you. Thank you thank so you. much. And, <laughs> and thank you, Cynthia. And uh, you'll remain part of the family. Um, so thank you very much. Thanks to my panelists, they were great, and to the co-facilitator of the breakout groups. I really hope that you enjoy the, the time to unpack all the different uh, topics that we discussed today, training communities, authorities, and training remotely. And I'm ending over to Charlie right now. <laughs>